Hey guys, am I audible, visible? Uh, if yes, say hi, hello, good evening. Hey guys, am I audible, visible? Hey guys. Okay, I hope I'm audible and visible. So welcome back everyone. Uh, so I'm taking class after uh, quite some time and uh, we will be starting the Ferrier series. I hope uh, Ankit sir today started off with uh, the pharmacology and I'm going to start with uh, pathology. So here, uh, the chapter name and faculty name, ignore that. Uh, these are the topics I'm going to cover today. I'm going to talk about cell injury, cell adaptation, intracellular accumulation and hemodynamics, fine. So I hope you all, all of you have got the Fare uh, soft copy in the app. I'll be going with the same thing. There are close to approximately 200 pages and we'll be covering each and everything what is there. So I'm sure that this series will definitely help you to ease through your final year, uh, second prof exams, right? Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Sai. Good. Hi, Suresh. Good evening, Danush. Meet and Vyas. Mehul. Fine. So if everything is set, let's start. So this is going to be a revision session for you. If you are lacking in any concepts, do let me know. I'll cover them as well. But I'll be going a little bit faster in the focus of how to attempt a question when it comes in an exam. Because in an exam, we have to get 50%, right? That's our entire goal in second prof uh, exams. We have to clear and we have to go to third prof, right? So you, uh, whatever, whichever state you are from, more or less, the distribution of papers is same, right? So you have acquired from a point of view that, okay, these are the things I want you to read for long answer, short answer, and ultra short answer on MCQ point. But from perspective of the first, uh, and the fourth chapter, the cell injury and hemodynamics, right? So if I have to ask a long answer question in the cell injury chapter, there are two things which has a very high probability of coming in exam. One is necrosis, the patterns of necrosis, types of necrosis and everything. The other one obviously is an apoptosis. And I'm 100% sure that you guys are experts in these, right? When it comes to short answers, right? A uh, uh, short note on uh, quite a few of them, right? And maybe if I want to go to the uh, hemodynamics chapter, the embolism, thromboembolism is one of the important topics which can come in a long uh, question because there is pulmonary thromboembolism, there is air embolism, there is your uh, amniotic fluid embolism, fat embolism, there are multiple aspects to it, fine? Okay, now let's come to the short answers. Uh, can anyone of you comment like what question can you expect in the first chapter for short answers? Let's make it interactive, fine? So uh, I'll try to finish by one and a half hours, but if it's a bit extensive going beyond that, apologies now itself, fine? So short answers, especially the short answers in the first chapter, intracellular accumulations. Uh, when you have the interest accumulations, I mean the fatty change, right? Perfect. I'll come to that. Be happy. The fatty changes can come as short answer. The calcifications, the pigments, the hemosudin melanin, that can come as short answer. And your cellular adaptation. I'm just considering in general cellular adaptation. I'm not just going for your uh, metaplasia. Yes, metaplasia can be asked. Hi hypertrophy can be asked. Hyperplasia can be asked. Atrophy is a bit rare, right? Cellular adaptation is, is commonly asked in a short answer thing. When you come to your hemodynamics chapter infarct is a thing which can be asked in a short answer right when i say infarct the red infarct the white infarct the differences of the red infarct can easily be asked in a short answer question right so these are the commonly asked ones in the uh, first chapter and the fourth chapter of hemodynamics which can come in an exam now let's look at the ultra short answers or an mcq shock as well shock is something which can be asked in a long answer it's a very important thing I'll not talk about shock today. Maybe if time permits, we'll uh, have a discussion about that as well, fine? Shock is generally a long answer question, especially you easily can get, get a clinical scenario, right? So uh, there's a road traffic accident and the patient was bleeding. So give me the pathogenesis of the shock or a patient with an infection and hypotension and uh, warm extremities. Give the pathogenesis of a septic shock. Septic shock and hemodynamic shock both have the very high probability of coming in a long answer and we'll see how to structure them as well, right? ultra short answer questions if your university has like two mark questions mcqs we'll leave them we have got a good um, amount of discussion for mcqs we leave them for now ultra short answers are generally definitions define necrosis define apoptosis define metaplasia right what is calcification what is dystrophic calcification you can have any definitions in the first chapter right and when you come to the fourth chapter edema the cause of edema can come as a two mark question just transudate, exudate, the differences can come in a true mark question, right? So these are the few important topics we have to cover. I'll try to cover maximum in this. If I leave anything, I'll definitely give you tiny, tiny updates of the ultra short answers in the WhatsApp community or in the Telegram community so that you can complete it now and need not look back at the chapter again, right? That's the focus. 
with respect to pathology your what i'm going to discuss will be told to you before i want you to just quickly go through the fare pdf and then sit for the class it will be a revision for you so that before the exam we are done and dusted with everything required for us fine so ready let's go ahead the first thing is about necrosis so i'll go go, go the same thing first going to be definition of necrosis can anyone define necrosis the necrosis and apoptosis can come as in definition if it's in two mark necrosis is defined as a microscopic form of cell death that's very very important the term microscopic necrosis is not a gross term necrosis is a microscopic form of cell death same with apoptosis right it's a microscopic form of cell death see these are a few things which your examiner will look for when it comes in a two mark this word is very important it's not a gross terminology it's a microscopic terminology right most often associated with inflammation that's important because that defines or differentiates necrosis with an apoptosis and is almost always pathological okay see these are the key words which i want you to remember in addition to this you can add whatever you want to but these keywords if they are there two mark is sorted off like if there's necrosis for 10 mark we'll uh, classify the marking pattern as two marks for the definition two marks for the types maybe for the pathogenesis few right so, so we'll define that so necrosis if you say microscopic form cell death associated with inflammation and it's almost always pathological that takes care of everything which is associated with necrosis a very see, uh, if you are you must have definitely written multiple exam papers right so highlight the definition part colored presentation unfortunately carries an importance at least with respect to university exam you come out of university exam all these becomes very very negligibly important right so go the definition structure of a question is very important first definition then the subtypes before before subtypes you can add on to it right the path, pathogenesis of features of necrosis okay so when i take pathogenesis you must have definitely learned about cell injury the reversible part irreversible part actually the reversible cell injury what is the starting point of reversible cell injury can anyone reply how does a reversible cell injury start or the most common cause of it okay uh me uh necrosis is an acute event cell death is an acute event most of the time it's with acute uh, neck uh, inflammation you need not mention that but it's understood it's an acute inflammation fine okay so most common cause of necrosis or your cell injury is your hypoxia so it always starts with an hypoxia perfect sign hypoxia or you can use the term ischemia whatever you want i'll leave it to you so ischemia or hypoxia is the commonest cause of cell death any form of cell death starts with a reversible process and then goes to a irreversible process here in necrosis it's a 10 mark question you might write your important pointers in light microscopy electron microscopy if you feel it's too much restrict just to the flow chart that should be more than enough right uh, vijay it's on uh, youtube you will definitely have it in the recorded format as well for sure fine okay now let's look at it and always remember a flow chart or a description carries much more weightage than a theoretical writing right so draw a cell just a cell and write there's a reduction of atp because of your hypoxia or ischemia which re results in reduced function of sodium potassium atps pump uh, i'm sure you must know this this pump is very important once this pump goes away add here entry of water okay see these are few key points which i want and it becomes a swollen cell and you can write cell swelling that's one of the light microscopic feature of reversible cell injury and i'm sure everyone knows that and highlight one more finding as well fatty change not at every cell but in few cells so you give a different color and maybe you can write in brackets predominantly liver because liver is something which predominantly has a fatty change so you are trying to tell to an examiner see i know where it is seen as well the conveying what you know is very very important here fine uh be happy give me some time and we are in the reversible part we'll definitely go to the reversible part soon fine okay so now that's what your reversible part is beyond this what happens is you will have multiple changes there if you want put a bifurcation and write electron microscopic features of cell injury can anyone tell me what are the electron microscopic features of a reversible cell injury this part maybe for an extra mark if you want i want you to add otherwise we'll continue the flow chart straight right so electron microscopic features you must have heard about the cellular blep formation that's an electron microscopic feature you must have heard about the detachment of the ribosomes right okay so you have detached ribosomes 
this detachment of ribosomes happens due to your swollen endoplasmic reticulum and what is the finding which is a world appearance in the black and white structure which is due to damage of it okay perfect swollen endoplasmic reticulum damage of the cell membrane the blep formation actually results in that what is the finding myelin figures right so this myelin figures when you write i want you to highlight that see there are few pointers which is important for an examiner also few pointers myelin figure you also know with confidence so please highlight that so i know that okay this guy knows about light microscopic finding he also knows about electron microscopic finding right so then again i am going to go to the irreversibility part so whenever you are going transition from a reversible injury to irreversible injury the most important thing is the etiology should persist what's the etiology in this condition hypoxia right so right here persistent hypoxia see this is important and if you want use different color codes and i'm sure you must be using all the color codes a persistent hypoxia or a persistent ischemia so by default i know that okay this process is a reversible process now only irreversibility comes so persistent hypoxia the main problem of the cell injury is entry of calcium or you can write entries and maybe and not in such a good medical term you can use influx of calcium okay okay uh, now be happy the lysosomal enzyme the enzyme activation actually is a part of the irreversible cell damage right so have a reversible cell injury once influx of calcium comes this influx of calcium is going to activate enzymes okay it's going to activate enzymes as simple as that so once it activates enzymes can anyone tell me what are the enzymes involved which causes the irreversible cell death there are three major enzymes for three components of a cell i have a cell membrane i have a cell cytoplasm i have a cell nucleus for that i have three different enzymes that's all the first enzyme i want you to write is phospholipase okay so phospholipase is for the cell's membrane as the name says it will destroy phospholipid bilayer if you have time just write that also it causes or breaks the cell membrane okay here i want to you to add an emphasis in very important point can i say this break of cell membrane is an hallmark of necrosis yes or no if you don't know i want you to comment yes or no do you think it will cause it's an hallmark of necrosis absolutely yes right so add a point that this is an hallmark finding in necrosis because one cell membrane is gone i know for a fact that it's necrosis apoptosis will not have this right so this is an hallmark of necrosis so i do have a finding for hallmark of necrosis then i have one more enzyme which is protease okay so like i said i have a cell cytoplasm then i have a cell membrane cell cytoplasm and nucleus protease if you want to add it will destroy cytoskeletal proteins the uh, one of the most important thing in an exam is you have to convey to the examiner i know stuff that's the important thing so instead of writing destroy cytoplasm which is little bit less uh, looking less uh, thing right so like cytoskeletal proteins so they also know that you know that cytoplasm is made of cytoskeletal protein because the first chapter of robbins which we generally ignore talks about all the cytoskeletal proteins right next the third part is your nucleus so in nucleus every teacher uh, raj kingdom uh, this is a ferrari series so i'm just going a little bit faster if you are uh, looking for the first time yes i'll definitely go slower please ask me wherever you want to go i'll go slower a little bit fine okay so nucleus so i want everyone here to comment what are the three phases or three damage in nucleus which is hallmark seen in necrosis i am sure everyone knows that starts with k so whenever nucleus acts on a nucleus we'll have three important findings which is the first one is pycnosis that's important okay then it progresses to karyo is for nucleus breaking of nucleus is karyorexis then it moves to karyolysis perfect right so these three terms are very important like i said when i am looking for pathogens of necrosis i by default i will look for these three terms in an exam paper because this defines me okay the nucleus is gone again if you have time you can write in brackets pycnosis is nothing but a condensed nucleus right it's a condensed nucleus a uh, meet whatever we are seeing is irreversible right so from this point of influx of calcium its persistent hypoxia becomes mean irreversible only right it starts with reversible then it automatically comes to irreversible fine okay 
So it's a condensed nucleus is what I'm going to call it as pignosis, karyorexis. We can write if you want broken nuclear debris. And karyolysis is implied. It's a completely lysed nuclear. So here you know the enzyme, you know the stages, and also you know what do each of them mean, right? So this kind of completes everything. This will hardly take one page, right? Let's go back to the first and then revise. If you are listening to me from the first, I want you to close the eyes so that you can picture what you're going to write, right? Let me, I also close the eyes. So first we have the definition of necrosis. It's a microscopic form of cell death associated with inflammation and almost always pathological, right? Then the pathogenesis, hypoxia, ischemia is the etiology. Whenever the cell has reduced ATP due to hypoxia, sodium potassium ATP stops functioning. Water enters, the cell swells. Cell swelling is a common finding seen in every cell injury and I also have fatty change which is particularly seen in river. If you want to put, put a hyphen and write the electron microscopic features. With this actually reversible cell injury ends. So if you are very artistic, maybe put a line here and write reversible on top and irreversible in the bottom. Fine. So once there is a persistent hypoxia which means my etio etiology is persisting, calcium comes inside which activates enzymes. In cell, I have three components, cells membrane, cell cytoplasm, cell nucleus. My membrane is destroyed by phospholipase, which is a hallmark of necrosis. Protease destroys my cytoskeletal protein and my nucleus destroys nucleus in the form of pycnosis, karyorexis as well as karyolysis. Clear? Neat? So that covers the entire pathogenesis of necrosis. So now we'll come to the next part of the equation because we are writing a long answer, right? So the definition carries two marks. This entire pathogenesis may carry like three, four marks, right? Next comes your long, uh, the types of necrosis, right? So can anyone tell me all the types of necrosis? Again, put a good heading. Presentation is very, very important for an exam point of view. What are the types of necrosis? I'm sure everyone here knows the types of necrosis. Coagulative, liquefactive, fibrinoid, fat, and caseous, right? Perfect. <clears throat> Again, <clears throat> you can write in any order. If I am an examiner, I don't generally mind an order, but in an exam point of view, you have to stick to the same order which your book talks about. Coagulative first, liquefactive second, caseous, fibrinoid and fat. Keep in the same order, it makes it much more easier for the examiner also because they have been teaching forever. So they know the sequence. So if you also write the sequence, you are just carrying on their memory, that's all. So that if you jumble the sequence, they might go and search for it. Don't let the examiner search for anything. Give what they want, that's more than enough, right? And if you're good in uh, changing the heading, uh, colors of the heading, change it, fine? Now let's go for coagulative necrosis. Again, please do remember, all these five different types of necrosis is maximum going to carry four or five marks, that's all. Don't overdo, at the same time, don't underdo. If you are an examiner, I want five mark, maximum one and a half to two pages. Beyond that, I don't expect. Don't keep on writing. Keep it crisp, simple and make sure everything is included. Arpan, sequence is not must. Like I said, if you go with the sequence, it is very good to retain the same examiner's memory. The examiner is searching for few things. If it's there, it makes them more comfortable and gives you, awards you more mark. That's all, right? Let's go to coagulator first. Starting with the most common subtype of necrosis. In every class, without fail, Every teacher must have told you. Coagulative necrosis is seen where? I'm sure you know where it is seen, right? It's seen in every solid organ in fact, except. Actually, except is also important because that's how we teach. It's in every solid organ in fact, except brain. If you want to use technical terminology for etiology, I would say it is seen in every organ with ischemia with except brain, right? It is seen in every solid organ in fact except brain infarct, right? Okay, perfect. So what is the mechanism of action? Though I have given you the entire mechanism of action uh, in the previous things, but I also need to know mechanism of action individually amongst necrosis because there's a slight variation as well, right? So coagulative necrosis, mechanism of action, Short forms are okay to some extent. Don't use too many short forms. MOA is mechanism of action, which is known to every teacher who is there in your uh, in your respective college, right? So mechanism of action of coagulated necrosis, it is protein degradation. Okay. But this is the mechanism of action for coagulated necrosis. Please emphasize that. This is very, very important for me. This is very, uh, ischemia is the etiology open. 
mechanism of action is protein degradation right okay next i want you always to include examples though you have written solid organ infarct it will be much more comfortable for a teacher if you see myocardial infarction a friendly type of calculator necros right use the commonest example myocardial infarction it's definitely one of the commonest causes one of the commonest thing which we encounter it's an infarct only solid organ infarct if you want add kidney infarct spleen infarct anything but don't miss myocardial infarct fine i'll come to it be happy i'll come to it so once i have done with the coagulating necrosis the mechanism of action and example now then you include the gross and the microscopic feature gross and microscopic feature is always the last the reason why i'm saying last is gross and microscopic feature is something which carries a weightage in an exam writing right so always you start with commonality in with gross and microscopy clinical scenario if required okay but in with gross and microscopy because that's where my reading stops if you write the gross as well as microscopy properly i won't even go and look into the next thing right so gross finding of any necrosis or any infarct what do you think is the color what do you think is the color pale color so a myocardial infarct, spleen infarct, or a kidney infarct, can I say it's well uh, properly delineated? Yes, it's a well-defined pale area is the gross finding, right? They will be well-defined. Most of the infarcts, I'm leaving a little bit of the uh, red infarcts. Most of the solid organ infarcts are well-defined pale areas. Most of the solid infarcts are well-defined pale areas, right? Perfect. Okay, so no, no, my gross is also done with. If you are good in drawing, you can just maybe put a spleen here. I'm not that good in drawing and put a wedge like area and shade rest of the thing red in color. So you can say that, okay, there's a wedge shaped infarct or a well defined pale infarct. If it's possible, do it. Don't overdo it again, right? Now let's come to microscopy. Microscopy for any necrosis. Can I say it'll be pink in color? Because there's karyorexis, karyolysis, everything is done with, right? So here I'll have pink areas or you can use technical terminologies right eosinophilic areas there's one more important thing which is required some of one of you told it chinmay said it it's an eosinophilic area with a maintained architecture because that's what differentiates coagulated necros from liquefactor necros right with maintained architecture please include this and please please highlight this because this is what as a pathologist i look for because pink area or eosinophilic area is for necrosis as well as apoptosis as well as necrotosis. When I see the maintained architecture, I know I'm talking about coagulated necrosis. Same here, well defined. I know I'm talking about coagulated necrosis, right? So these are few points which as an examiner, I would expect in your exam paper. If it's there, I don't even read about rest of thing, right? Maintained architecture, well defined. So this covers your coagulated necrosis. Go point wise. Often the reason for eosinophilia is it's nucleus is gone, right? Pycnosis, karyorexis, karyolysis. It's completely gone. And it's a dead protein. Dead protein will be eosinophilic only, right? If you want, you can write actually intense eosinophilia also, but pink color because nucleus is dead, right? So here, this might in a long paper, in a, maybe one fourth of the paper it will cover, but it has all the pointers what I need for coagulating the process. Nothing more is required, nothing less required. Commonality, where do I find? Mechanism, one example, and gross and microscopy. Fine, done. Let's go to one more subtype. Yeah, it's a subtype. I'm not going to the biggest thing, next necrosis. I just want to include this as well. Maybe we'll include this post your liquefactor. Okay. So liquefactor necrosis. I want you guys to say the same format. Where do you see them? This is not the most common subtype, so we'll ignore them. So where do you see them? You see them in brain infarct, right? It's in a brain infarct. That's one of the important thing. That's at least this is minimum thing which I want, right? Next is my mechanism of action. Mechanism of action is again very simple. What's the mechanism of action? Here it is not protein degradation. That's very important. Here is a lysosomal enzyme activation. Okay. It's a lysosomal enzyme activation. That's a mechanism of action here in case of a liquefactor necrosis, right? Perfect lipase or any lysosomal enzyme not just lipase lipase is one of the important thing but any lysosomal activation for that matter right example here i don't want you to write cns infarct 
See here you have to be very very careful because no one takes a biopsy for brain infarct right though I see them in brain infarct I am not going to write that as an example what I am going to write as an example is aptus cavity this is important please don't forget this right abscess cavity you see liquefactor necrosis because in abscess cavity you have lots of neutrophils lots of wbc granule lysosomal enzyme activation right don't write cns infarct because clinically no one is going to see cns infarct in microscopy but abscess biopsy i do get that's important right next for me we're going to same thing gross and microscopy do you think Perfect. Wet gangrene, I'll come to it very soon, Chinmay. Do you think an uh, liquefactor necrosis will be very well defined? Not, not that much defined like in coagulated necrosis. It's definitely paler. It's liquefactive. The name itself says that it's like a liquid area, right? Liquefied areas. Grossly. The name tells it's liquefied. It'll be like a semi-solid kind of a structure. After cavity also has the same thing, fine. Uh, be happy if you want you can draw but i think in a long answer at least for these things i won't expect a microscopy maybe for a cbc finding i would expect sickle cell maybe for a microscopy or in case of a systemic pathology i might expect but here it's a very uniform thing because you are going to shade pink in color that's all if you have time shade it right the microscopy here the most important thing like i told in your um, coagulated necrosis it's a maintained architecture right here it's same eosinophilic but lost architecture that's very important because loss of architecture tells to every pathologist i'm dealing with a liquefactor necrosis and not a coagulated necrosis right so you know the difference here same thing one example mechanism of action again gross and microscopy that should be enough right now let's introduce gangrene here because robbins and most of the textbooks deal gangrene a little bit far further they don't, though they are a part of coagulated liquefactor, it's a little bit further, fine. I'll come to it sooner, but fine. So write gangrenous in the side if you want to. So in gangrene, first gangrene is a gross terminology. It's not a microscopic terminology, right? So gangrene has two different types. Dry gangrene and wet gangrene. Dry gangrene, you see what type of necrosis? Coagulated type of necrosis. And in wet gangrene, you see liquefactor type of necrosis okay so this an additional point that's all it's not the main thing important for me but it's an additional point which is very much if required for us fine okay fine okay up and uh, karyorexis karyolysis and pycnosis these three stages are seen only in necrosis it is not a feature of apoptosis when we'll see apoptosis we'll look into it apoptosis will never have karyolysis fine so that's for the third thing uh, second thing liquefactor necrosis or caseous necrosis Whenever you talk about caches, invariably the first thing which comes to your mind is cheese-like. So here I want you to start with gross pathology because there are few things which strikes uh, any examiner or, or any medico for that matter, right? So gross pathology, so the gross finding, you will have cheese-like areas, cheese-like yellowish areas of necrosis. That's why I call it caseous necrosis because that's a definition and you won't forget them as well, right? And what is one uh, disease which comes to your mind when you think of caseous? What's one disease which comes to your mind? Obviously for everyone, this disease will come to your mind. Etiology or example, there's only one guy. Never forget this guy, tuberculosis. If you want to add, you can add your histoplasmosis, coccidiomycosis, but never ever forget tuberculosis. Because that's something which is bare minimum which i want every student to know about right so tb histoplasma is an added thing you can use your leprosy as well that also will show cases necrosis it's a cheese like thing and that's one thing for a thing microscopy it's a granular variant of necrosis if you want if i want to look for one term i would look for this term it's a granular variant of normal necrosis I will see eosinophilia and there will be a little bit of granularity which will be there. Maintained architecture, loss of architecture and granular area, right? So these are three types of necrosis, fine. I don't have a page. What I'll do is I'll go up and I'll write and maybe once the PDF comes, just uh, rearrange them, fine. The next necrosis for me is then fibrinoid necrosis. In an exam, please don't divide because once we have learned one we are learning i told you like fibrinoid 
So fibrin like necrosis. These are some things which is for your understanding. You need not always put an exam because these are not there in the books. Sometimes you may unfortunately have the ego of the examiner. So stay simple. In an exam, there's only one rule. Examiner is always right, right? Fibrin or necrosis, it's equivalent to a vessel wall necrosis. This is what I want you to remember. You see them in any vessel wall. Fibrinoid is seen in vessel wall, that's all. So examples of fibrinoid necrosis. That's I'm sure you know examples. I just want you to try superficially vasculitis. Don't pinpoint and write polyarthritis nodosa. Because every vasculitis will have it. But I'm sure for everyone, the first thing which comes to your mind is polyarthritis nodosa, right? That's something which is definitely which will come to your mind, right? So fibrinoid necrosis. Polyarthritis nodosa is an example, I'm not denying, but every vasculitis will have it, right? And I want you to add one more thing, add this. Ash of bodies in rheumatic heart disease. Because this not everyone will write. This might fetch you a little bit of extra mark. In rheumatic heart disease, in the ash of nodules or the ash of body, you will see fibrinoid necrosis for sure, right? Two examples should be more than enough for me. If you want an extra point, write this extra point. Fibrinoid necrosis on a microscopy, they are TAS positive. There's one unique thing which is seen in fibrinoid necrosis. Actually, one of the reason the name came is due to that. It's a PAS positive necrosis. Not many of the necrosis will be PAS positive, but fibrinoid necrosis will be PAS positive. There's an extra edge that's off, right? Last. What's the last type of necrosis? We have heart necrosis, right? Now tell, uh, tell me how will you write about fat necrosis. I just want three, four uh, lines in which you have to convey to the examiner. Okay, I know the stuff. It's fat necrosis. What will you write? What will you write in fat necrosis? What all comes to your mind? First, there are two types of fat necrosis and I want you to convey to the examiner. I know both the type of fat necrosis, right? I have your enzymatic fat necrosis. At the same time, you have traumatic fat necrosis, fine? Okay. After we'll talk about that sometime later, right? So I have trauma induced fat necrosis and I have enzymatic fat necrosis. Okay. In both, the mechanism of action is same. Here, mechanism of action is lipase. The lipase is the one which is going to destroy the fat. It's that's why I call it in fat necrosis, right? The lipase is going to destroy everything. Traumatic fat necrosis, the best example which everyone will in, uh, remember is breast parenchyma. Breast parenchyma is where trauma is very common and the reason why most of the pathologists remember it is it comes as a differential diagnosis for DCIS in a mammogram. So breast parenchyma and traumatic fat necrosis, they'll definitely remember. If you want, you can add anything like gluteal region or the deltoid region, you can add for sure. Enzymatic fat necrosis. Please specify clearly what you are trying to convey here. Enzymatic fat necrosis is not seen in pancreas. It is seen in peripancreatic tissue and momentum. Because this is something which every examiner will look for. If you superficially read, you will write pancreas. It's not seen in pancreas. It is seen in your peripancreatic tissue. That's important. And momentum. In a case of pancreatitis. I'll explain this once again because this is very important for you to remember. Okay. It's seen in a case of pancreatitis only because in pancreatitis you'll have all the enzyme activation. The lipase is also an enzyme which will be activated. The lipase will slowly diffuse outside, goes and destroys the fat outside the pancreas and the fat in the omentum, right? So it is not seen in case of pancreatitis in pancreas. It is seen in peripancreatic tissue momentum, right? So this conveys whatever I want you to remember, fine? Saponification, if you want, you can add. But I would say maybe slightly ignore that because saponification or salt formation is seen in all the types of necrosis, not only your fat necrosis, right? So we know what are the different types of necrosis, right? So necrosis, we are the definition, we are the pathogens is written, and the types of necrosis, we follow a template. Coagulative is the most common one. Spend some time, explain that. Then once first thing is done, rest of them is automatically done. You have caseous, you have liquefactor, you have caseous, you have fibrinoid as is fat. Fine. Done. I hope if necrosis comes in exam, you know how to actually structure the answer and I'm sure you'll be able to write the answer as well, fine. Diagrams wherever necessary, but for a necrosis, I generally would not expect a diagram, but if you're good in drawing diagrams, please do include diagrams, right? That gives an extra edge, at least you have attempted, gives an extra edge, that's all, fine. Let's go to the next long answer, fine. Any doubts in necrosis, do let me know. 
maybe a couple of minutes we'll take off for the doubts and then we'll go to the next one is apoptosis no doubts in necrosis okay great so now let's go to apoptosis so apoptosis what's the first thing which comes to your mind when you think of apoptosis you just remember one thing you and me both are same whatever comes to your mind first will come to my mind my mind also first so i will search for the name apoptosis is equivalent to everyone will write this it's an programmed cell death okay. it is what everyone remembers it right i've been uh, uh, will uh, explain the carrier release and carrier excess with respect when you come to apoptosis right it's in programmed cell death again i want you to start with definition apoptosis is also a microscopic form of cell death which is both physiological and pathological that's important because necrosis was only pathological this can be both physiological and pathological and the most important thing is not associated with inf inflammation right and there'll be no inflammation as well okay that's kingdom whenever i'm going fast you just tell me i'm fast i'll go slow the reason for me to go faster is since it's a revision for you i wanted to cover a good amount of thing in one and a half two hours so that i don't make it a routine class that's all fine it's a microscopic form of cell death physiological and pathological associated with no inflammation that sorts my definition that's more than enough but any necros or apoptosis don't forget this whatever cell death what we read in the first chapter all of them are microscopic it's not a gross form it's a microscopic form of cell death fine so now you have told that it's both physiological and pathological so if i am mentioning something the next automatically my examiner or anyone's mind goes for is examples at least one example for physiological one example for pathological i'm sure you know more than one examples but please include them so examples for physiological form of cell death can anyone tell me at least one case where you have physiological form of cell death any one any one cause where you see cell death physiologically wbc after inflammation perfect can we go a little bit up embryology embryology there are lots of places where physiological form of cell death happen what have you said wbc after inflammation is true the negative selection which happens in thymus that also is true removal of autoimmune lymphocytes right physiological form of cell death maybe give an example of uh, notochord because it's something which is commonly seen in embryology right notochord will disappear in embryogenesis fine time is disappearing perfect so there are lots of example you can give embryology notochord you can give an example of thymus which disappears it's a physiological form of cell death and like you said wbc after inflammation that's a very good example right after inflammation or any hypersensitivity all the wbcs will be disappearing due to physiological form of apoptosis only pathological pathological is also important for me because that's why we are here right at least two things don't forget one is dna damage any mutation which happens in our body the cells die by apoptosis we have a mutation automatically cells die only by apoptosis that's a dna damage anything else you know viral induced cell death okay. the viral induced cell death mostly is by apoptosis only right protein accumulation perfect sana that's the third thing which i want you to remember if you remember protein accumulation great that may fetch you the full mark but the first two things don't forget protein accumulation is the one which will cause er stress which causes apoptosis right because dna damage and viral induced cell death has been there for years together protein accumulation is an add on in the recent years uh, how to remember viral accumulation i will just ask you a question i am sure most of you will know the answer for this and in viral hepatitis there's a name body what is that body called us in viral hepatitis there's a name body what is that body called us you know it starts with c what do you call them we call them councilman bodies right i'm sure you remember councilman bodies councilman body is an apoptotic body so viral hepatitis will have councilman body it's nothing but an apoptotic hepatocyte so that you remember them right civet body is seen in your lichen planus yes that's also an example for apoptotic body but that's seen in lichen planus fine okay so i know a definition 
I have given examples for physiological and pathological. Then the same thing what we did for apo uh, necrosis, pathogenesis or the mechanism. In apoptosis, I don't have subtypes. It's just the mechanism which I want to add here, right? So now let's go to the mechanism of apoptosis. Again, like I said, pictorial representation of the, in the form of flowchart is more important than writing big, big paragraphs of theory. Okay? So in apoptosis mechanism, what all comes to your mind superficially before writing just for a second think. I have initiator phase, I have execution phase. In the initiator phase, I have extrinsic pathway, I have intrinsic pathway, then everything comes to your common or an execution pathway. That's what you must have read, right? Then let's go to the microscopy. So here again, I want you to just mention here, I have an initiator phase. Okay. Right in big letter, I have initiator phases. In the initiator phase, just maybe give some gap and right, I have an extrinsic pathway and I have an intrinsic pathway. Okay. If you have time, you can write parallel. Like if it's a very 15 mark question or something, you can write extrinsic first, intrinsic second, then go to execution. But if you say it's a com like uh, uh, write both about necrosis and apoptosis, if it's a question like that, make it simple. Need not explain what is backs back BCL2. If it's only about apoptosis, you need to explain backs back BCL2 as well, right? So in extrinsic pathway, it's generally for the viral induced type of cell death. Here it's generally for the DNA mutation. So you're also saying that what's the etiology of trigger for extrinsic pathway and intrinsic pathway. One is DNA mutation, other one is viral, fine. Okay. So what happens in extrinsic pathways? Again, draw a cell with a virus, just add on to it. And then you have an lymphocyte. Uh, which lymphocyte will come when there's a virus? Which lymphocyte do you think will protect a cell when there's a virus? You know the lymphocyte. What is the lymphocyte? It's your CD8, right? So if you want, write CD8 T lymphocyte or just write T cells. That's more than enough for me. T lymphocyte, CD8 T cells. So here is where I'll have the interaction. So when this binds, I have an interaction which has your FAS binding with your FAS ligand. So once this FAS and FAS ligand binds due to virus infected cell, this will activate a complex called as an FADD, which is FAS associated death domain, right? It's an FAS associated death domain. So once I have these two guys getting activated, this will activate the downstream guy, which is caspase. Can anyone tell me what are the caspase numbers here? There's a slight change in the Faraday uh, notes what you have. Caspase 8 as well as caspase 10 will be involved in the extrinsic pathway and caspase 9 will be involved in the intrinsic pathway, right? So here I have caspase 8 as well as caspase 10 which will be involved in the extrinsic pathway of apoptosis, fine. Okay, now let's go to the intrinsic pathway parallelly. Since we are discussing both parallelly, it makes much sense for us to include them, right? So here again, intrinsic pathway, which is also named as mitochondrial mediated. So I'm giving one more explanation for them. It happens in the mitochondria, right? So what happens here is, in the mitochondria, if you want, if you're good in drawing again, draw mitochondria. So whenever there's a trigger of, put a trigger of DNA mutation or DNA damage. So in the mitochondria, what happens is there will be an excess of backs, backs and back or the pro apoptotic genes. And there'll be a reduction of BCL2. If you want here, write in brackets, pro apoptotic and anti apoptotic. If you want, right, if you, you can just mention them, right? So back and back will be elevated and your BCL2 will be reduced. Because of this, who is the person who, who exits mitochondria? Cytochrome C, right? Because of this, my cytochrome C goes to the cytoplasm, exits to cytoplasm. So when they exit to cytoplasm cytochrome C, it binds with one more protein called as APAF. Apaf is apoptotic activating factor and this binding will activate, will form a complex called as apoptosome which again activates your caspases. 
let's say gas space nine right okay take one page maybe or half or uh, three fourths of a page to explain both of them right that's i'm just going up again once for us for a, a quick recall so i have initiator phase in that extrinsic and intrinsic extrinsic is where fast fas fas ligand mediated which activates fadd which gives you caspase 8 and 10 intrinsic is where your mitochondria there's a dna mutation Bax gets activated bcl2 gets inactivated cytochrome c comes outside with an protein called as apa which activates caspase 9 so once these are present either of this okay either of this is going to activate execution phase so right in the corner now i'm going to execution phase it's not initiator phase anymore it's execution phase okay. i have two things i have an initiator phase and i have an execution phase so once in the execution phase both these cat phases or either of them can activate two more enzymes these will activate again cat phase three four or three and six okay and give some space and also activates endonuclease okay. caspase is nothing but a protease right so caspase activation will do only one thing which destroys protein so this will destroy the cytoskeletal same thing what we write wrote in necrosis it destroys the cytoskeletal proteins and right? destroys it that's all and because of this destruction of the cytoskeletal protein, what happens is cell size. It will become smaller or it will become bigger. I have a beautiful hut. I am destroying all the strings or all the thing which is holding the hut. What will happen? It will shrink, right? Because of this, the cells shrink. It will automatically shrink, right? It will become smaller. That's very important because necrosis, there's a cell swelling. It becomes smaller. Now let's go to endonuclease. It's an endonuclease. If you remember your biochemistry, Restriction endonuclease acts only on palindromic sites, right? So you can actually draw a diagram here. So if this is my DNA, so this endonuclease acts on the DNA and it cuts them into smaller pieces. This we call it an DNA fragmentation or a chromatin condensation. So DNA will be fragmented. Okay. Arpan, if you're still there. Here, I won't have lysis. It's just cut DNA. Cut DNA is non-functional. But in necrosis, I will have complete lysis because it's not an endonuclease, it's a nucleus. That's the main difference between necrosis and apoptosis. It's a fragmented DNA and this is actually a hallmark of apoptosis. So hallmark of necrosis is actually loss of your cell membrane. Hallmark of apoptosis is actually DNA fragmentation or the chromatin condensation, right? So this is what happens here. Can we stop apoptosis here or is there any other important step beyond this? Or can we stop this how apoptosis happens? Is there anything else beyond this? There's actually a very important thing beyond this, right? So once execution phase is done, now I want you to include the microscopy here, right? So once execution phase is done, this results in a structure called as an apoptotic body. Perfect. So apoptotic body is a very important thing which I want you to remember, which I want you to write. Apoptotic body, perfect. Aphrocytosis also is required. That's where it ends. It doesn't end with your ex execution phase. I need to explain apoptotic body. I need to explain the concept of aphrocytosis, which completes everything. So apoptotic body here, it's a smaller cell and it's a pink, dark pink cytoplasm because it destroyed thing. And it may or may not have nuclear component. That's how it is. It may or may not have condensed nucleus. Okay. So again, it doesn't end with this. So at the end of apoptosis, I have a structure is called an apoptotic body. Maybe here you can write example what we started, councilman body. So, so that they know that, okay, this guy also knows how to correlate it. Councilman body seen in hepatitis. Councilman body seen in hepatitis is actually an apoptotic body. Or you can write like Sana said, civet body seen in lichen planus. It's an apoptotic body. So I know not just apoptosis, I also know the application of apoptosis in systemic pathology, right? Once apoptotic body is there, 
again don't stop with that extrapolate so once there's an apoptotic body this apoptotic body will have each me signals there are few terms like i said is important eat me signals is again an important term which might be complements complement protein is an or an opsonization that's all i have complement protein that's one you have your phosphatidyl serine at least remember phosphatidyl serine because it's one of the important eat me signal for us thrombospondin also if you can do it right so with this you will have macrophage which will clear apoptotic body You can write step by step also. I am writing it horizontally due to the lack of space. Eat me signal, complement protein, phosphatidyl serine, which will be, if you want to draw a diagram, put an apoptotic body and surrounding them, write complement proteins and phosphatidyl serine, and then a macrophage coming in eating it. And this part, don't write as phagocytosis. The term is very important. And this part is called epherocytosis. Okay. Because these are few terms which is included. Because phagocytosis is a term generally I use in inflammation. But apoptosis, do you have inflammation? You don't have inflammation, right? So use the term epherocytosis. That's a very correct terminology. And that's how macrophage clears the entire apoptotic part, right? That completes entire apoptosis. It's very simple. We have included maybe like three, four slides. That's enough. Three, four slides in a PowerPoint. If I'm right, I'm also just writing it, right? You can easily write one, two to two and a half pages. That is more than enough for a question, which will fetch you six, seven marks easily, right? So you have a definition, examples, and the mechanism. If it's a 15 mark question or it's a very long question, explain the intrinsic pathway, the pro apoptotic factors, BIM, BIT, BAT, the sensors or cell stress. Otherwise, extrinsic, intrinsic pathway of activation, then goes to the execution phase. In execution phase, ends with the apoptotic body and ends with an eat me signal. Fine, clear. Any doubt in apoptosis, do let me know. If not, let's go to the next. Uh, that's a very important short answer. You are going to fill the pages. I'm not going to tell anything. Necros or apoptosis. Any doubts? High case chart. Okay, let's go to necros versus apoptosis. See, just now we only learned necros and apoptosis, right? So you are going to tell me each and every difference between necrosis versus apoptosis. I'll just fill it. Maybe I'll ask you leading questions so that we go in a proper thing, right? So necros versus apoptosis, fine. Right? Okay, the first thing, which is physiological and pathological. Necros or apoptosis, which is both physiological and pathological. So necros and apoptosis, both physiological and pathological, right? Perfect. Necros is only pathological. It's almost always pathological. So that's the main difference for me. One is always pathological, one is both physiological and pathological, right? Perfect. Great. So now next question. If something is physiological as well as pathological, will there be inflammation? We're just going to link one to the other so that you don't forget anything. If it's all one physiological and pathological, there should be no inflammation, right? It cannot have inflammation because inflammation will have pain. A physiological cell death cannot have pain. It's physiological. Physiological cannot inflict pain, right? If it's always pathological, it can have pain. So it will be associated with inflammation. Perfect. Again, I started with a very simple thing. I'm linking that to the second point. We will link that to the third point also. Okay. I'm having inflammation. So the amount of cells which necrosis will kill will be one or a group of cells. Good evening, Jan. Will be one cell or a group of cells. I have inflammation there and I'm killing cells. Will I kill one cell or a group of cells? Obviously be a group of cells, right? Because there's an inflammation, necrosis generally happens in a large group of cells. It cannot happen in a single cell. Even a mosquito bite cannot happen in one squamous epithelium. It will be an area. It will be a group of cells that will be involved in, in, in a necrosis because of inflammation. There is no inflammation in apoptosis. Can a single cell die? Possible, right? Here, it can be a single cell death or sometimes a small group of cells. Why I am using small group also is thymus. It cannot be like one one cell. It might be a small group of cells die. Because to kill one one cell in thymus is going to take forever for me to destroy thymus or your notochord or any embryology, right? In an adult, generally the single group because DNA damage happens in a cell. That cell alone dies. Other cells will not be involved. There's no inflammation. So it's a single group of cells, right? Hello, Divakar. Okay. So now we know the third point as well. 
the fourth point is i just want you to write this microscopic findings microscopic findings or findings on the mechanism whatever you know cell swelling where do you see cell swelling cell swelling obviously we see in necrosis right i'll have swelling of cells i'll see in necrosis you will see your swelling endoplasmic reticulum if you want to write if you want to write your uh, swollen endoplasmic reticulum you can write it here if you want to write your nuclear changes you can write it here i'm just writing pycnosis karyorexis and karyolysis since you already read i'm just using short forms there right again there's a microscopic finding for necrosis apoptosis has only one microscopic finding at the end i have apoptotic bodies okay again if you want to describe the apoptotic body smaller cell pink cytoplasm and a condensed nucleus go ahead and do it if not just ignore it fine right? here again please add on to it you will see surrounding inflammation inflammatory cells is always a part and parcel of necrosis you cannot help it it will be there for sure fine right? that third point is done we did microscopy we did inflammation we did the basic thing physiological pathological right then we'll come to the way of finding way of identification we know that microscopy is definitely a way of identification but if you have seen robins there used to be a dna electrophoresis pattern right i'm sure you must have seen that that's there in robins as well which will have step ladder pattern of dna necrosis or apoptosis next thing for me is dna electrophoresis which will have step ladder pattern apoptosis or necrosis in other words which will have fragmented dna fragmented dna is what step ladder pattern is right so fragmented dna is seen in apoptosis which means step ladder pattern of dna is seen in apoptosis so here i have a pattern called as a step ladder pattern of dna electrophoresis okay it's a step ladder pattern of dna electrophoresis that's one here and in case of a necrosis we have something called as a smearing pattern Again, this is not something to memorize. The reason why I wrote step ladder pattern here is apoptotic body will have chromatin condensation, DNA fragmentation. The next thing of DNA fragmentation is step ladder pattern. Here I have karyolysis. The next thing of DNA in karyolysis is nothing but a smear pattern of karyolysis. Again, just linking with other point, right? Last thing for me is one more way of identification. If I cannot identify apoptosis or necrosis using microscopy or anything, I would need some biochemical test. That's very important as well, right? So, is, is there any test or any other way of identification? Clinical markers, right? So, we'll use markers for identification because that's important as well. Myocardial infarction. What enzyme do you do for identifying myocardial infarction? I'm sure you do that. You know that as well. There's one enzyme which is done after ECG. I do these enzymes, right? Markers here for necrosis. Example, MI. Proponents. Perfect. CKMB. Right. We can write proponents. We can write CKMB. If it's an uh, hepatitis, AST, ALT, all these are markers of necrosis. That's all. When the cell dies, all the intracellular content come outside. Right. Proponents, CKMB is a marker for necrosis in case of myocardial infarction. LDH, that also. Any intracellular enzyme will come outside. That's how I pick up necrosis clinically using markers. But in apoptosis, we have a marker on biopsy, not on a blood test, right? I have a marker called as anaxin. Okay. So anaxin V or anaxin 5, right? So anaxin is a marker. If you want add specifically, it's a tissue marker. It's not a blood marker, it's a tissue marker. We read phosphatidylized strain, right? Like that, anaxin will bind to the phosphatidyl strain. So that's a marker for apoptosis. So we know all the differences now, right? I'll just go up once again. So I have one thing which is always pathological, physiological plus pathological, then we linked it to inflammation, then we linked it to, since this inflammation, there's a large group of cell, single group of cell, then we went to the microscopy, one ended with karyolysis, so I have a smearing pattern here, and one ended with apoptotic body, DNA fragmentation, so I have a step ladder pattern, and I have one clinical marker, it's an MI proponent, or you can give any example on your matter, and there's an anaxin V for a tissue marker, right? So that's about you in uh, necrosis and apoptosis. So we are done with necrosis, we are done with apoptosis, and we are also done with the differences between necrosis and apoptosis. Now let's go to your favorite part, cell adaptation. So for every student, cell adaptation is one of the most favorite part, right? Okay, so you are going to tell me how to structure this. There's a question on cell adaptation. If it's a long answer, 
explain all four. Otherwise, it's generally like explain hypertrophy with an example, explain hyperplasia with an example, right? So first thing about cellular adaptation is, if it's a long thing, cellular adaptation, uh, like everything I need in uh, definition. Can anyone define cellular adaptation? There are four different types of cell adaptation. Adaptation, this is nothing but an, it's an adaptive response to any external stimuli. I'm not specifying it since I'm using it, a uniform definition, right? So to any external stimuli, which is almost reversible, almost always a reversible finding there are few exceptions we know that for sure okay. once the stimuli is removed once the stimuli is removed okay. this is one of the easiest definition of the lad adaptation if you don't remember the definition what is there in the book you need not always be book definitions we have crossed the 11th and 12th standard to remember newton's law right but an adaptive response to any external stimuli almost always reversible once the stimulus is removed because i need to convey to the teacher or anyone right uh, reading my paper i know what is the adaptation mean then write the types of adaptation the types of adaptation i am sure you know that i have hyperplasia hypertrophy metaplasia and yeah atrophy right okay And we have atrophy. Perfect. Okay. So again, we have to structure something so that we can explain all the four things with the same template. So if I need to explain hyperplasia, can anyone tell me one example of hyperplasia? Apart from the uterus in pregnancy, can anyone give me any pathological example of hyperplasia? Endometrial hyperplasia is a pathological example for hyperplasia, right? So when I'm going to write about hyperplasia, Again, I want what is the stimulus because I have used few things, stimuli or stress. I need to explain what is this. And once the stimuli is removed, it has to be reversible. So I need to include the physiological part. I need to include the pathological part. And I also have to tell what will happen if the stimulus is not removed. That also we have to talk about, right? So for hyperplasia, first, again, I need to, in a single term, on a single line, I have to write or define hyperplasia. Can anyone define hyperplasia in a single word? Hyperplasia. It is increase in the number of cell number. Right? It's not cell size, it's a cell number. Right? Okay. So it's nothing but by definition, it's an increase in cell number due to stem cell proliferation. I'll tell you why I included the term stem cell here. Only stem cell can proliferate. No other cells in my body can give rise to new cell, right? So that makes it right. Second thing, if stem cell is involved in any pathogenesis, what do you think will happen? Is there a risk of cancer or not? And involving stem cell in any pathogenesis, there's definitely a risk of cancer, right? There's an increase in cell number due to stem cell proliferation that gives me the, both the mechanism as well as the definition of hyperplasia, right? And we use the term stimuli. So use the same term here. Stimulus most of the time is hormonal. Most of the stimulus for hyperplasia is hormonal. Not always, but most are hormonal, right? Then I have to talk about physiological hyperplasia. One example, and maybe for pathological hyperplasia. You know, I explain everything. Just one one word. Physiological hyperplasia. Uh, there are multiple examples here. Uh, there are two examples you want to remember. One so that the teacher knows that you read Robbins because in hyperplasia and Robbins, it's always around liver. Even if we cut half of the liver, it'll have a compensatory hyperplasia. That's one more example, one more heading, we'll use it. Physiological hyperplasia, the best example is estrogen derived or estrogen induced endometrial hyperplasia during menstrual cycle. Or you can write during proliferative phase of menstrual cycle. If you want to be very specific, you can use that. Otherwise, just menstrual cycle. Okay. That's clear example of physiological hyperplasia. Then if it's pathological hyperplasia, I have one more heading. I want you to include that as well. We'll include the third, right? Pathological hyperplasia, same. 
hyper estrogenism because we gave an example of estrogen induced hyperplasia and menstrual cycle so i'm going to use hyper estrogenism okay so hyper estrogenism will result in endometrial hyperplasia i call it pathological right we just use the term endometrial hyperplasia so if you want to score a little bit of extra marks tell you cause of hyperestrogenism in the arrow mark that's why i put an arrow mark hyperestrogenism can be due to pcod pcos that's one of the commonest cause right can be due to an obesity can be due to an tumor if you know about granulosa cell tumor write them otherwise just a tumor anything which increases estrogen level i'll have endometrial hyperplasia this is my etiology here i know the mechanism and i know the outcome that's endometrial hyperplasia right again like i said we use a definition saying that once the stimulus is removed hyperplasia will be reversible physiological or pathological right if it's persistent it can result in endometrial adenocarcinoma so it gives me the complete thing in endometrial adenocarcinoma which completes the cycle right so because we started with stem cell and use the definition of if it's removed it will be reversed if it's not removed there's a chance of irreversibility which results in endometrial adenocarcinoma right okay the third type of hyperplasia which i want you to write here is compensatory hyperplasia i'm not including it or even robbins doesn't call it either physiological or pathological it's just written as compensatory hyperplasia right there are two classical examples for compensatory hyperplasia one is liver right so liver hyperplasia liver will definitely undergo hyperplasia post hepatectomy okay post surgery or post destruction of liver generally post surgery okay though it's abnormal pathological but they don't call it pathological because i'm doing a surgery i'm intervening as a therapeutics of some uh, let's say there's a hemangioma i cut a lobe of a liver liver will grow back hemangioma is a pathogenesis there surgery is an intervention that that's why you don't use it uh, as physiological or pathological you use the term compensatory compensatory hyperplasia is a very well known thing uh, that's where you you in your first classes they must have told right uh, there's a mythological story behind it as well eagle came and keep, kept on eating the liver and liver started growing again and again back right so liver hyperplasia post surgery is the best example for compensatory hyperplasia right so that completes entire thing what you know to need to on hyperplasia definition stimulus one physiological pathological the causes and also yeah compensatory hyperplasia right second cell adaptation we'll use the same template cell hypertrophy so hypertrophy what do you think is the definition of hypertrophy it's an increase in the cell size right what increases cell size stem cell division or excess protein production what increases cell size division of stem cells or excess protein production it's excess protein production right okay sure raj i'll do it so hypertrophy is nothing but increase in cell size okay due to excess production of proteins So the excess production of proteins, there's an increase in cell size, but there's no cell division here. There's no involvement of stem cells here. If stem cells are not involved, will there be a damage? Will there be neoplasia formation? No. Here neoplasia formation will not be there, right? That's what hypertrophy definition is. Again, stimulus. Stimulus for most of the hypertrophy is a mechanical stimuli. It's always a mechanical stimuli, right? be it physiological or be it pathological. It's always a mechanical stimuli, right? What's the example for physiological hypertrophy? There are two examples, two muscles, smooth muscle and straightened muscle. In pregnancy, it can become enlarged because of the growing fetus. And when you lift weights, exercise, which also will increase your straightened muscle thickness, right? So when you go with physiology, a physiological example, have <clears throat> uterine size during pregnancy or uterine smooth muscle to be specific during pregnancy it becomes more 
Next is your straighten muscle, right? A skeletal muscle during exercise. That also will increase the size, right? During exercise, skeletal muscle also grows. That also is an example of a physiological example of a hypertrophy. So I know about physiological hypertrophy, two examples, two different types of muscle. Smooth muscle and uterus and skeletal muscle during exercise, right? Now let's go to pathological. So I do have one more striated muscle. What's the other striated muscle in our body? Apart from the skeletal muscle, I have one more striated muscle. What's the other striated muscle? The other striated muscle is your cardiac muscle, right? So it's pathological. Whenever you use the term pathological, it always comes with etiology. It's always etiopathological. So I know that cardiac muscle will become bigger. I need to know where as well, right? So there are two incidences where cardiac muscle becomes bigger. One is hypertension. In case of an hypertension, there will be an cardiomegaly or an cardiac muscle hypertrophy. And one more is any volume overload condition like regurgitation, right? We have an aortic regurgitation or anything or just right valvular regurgitation. So valvular regurgitation also will cause hypertrophy. So in case of valvular regurgitation, you can add one more extra point. There will be a volume overload because the one, first one is hypertension, pressure. It's direct pressure overload. Here I have an volume overload so in case of a volume overload again which will end up in cardiac hypertrophy so i have two types or two etiology which causes pathological hypertrophy which is volume overload here again if it's persistent always have the same template we have saw pathological hyperplasia endometrial hyperplasia if it's persistent resulted in endometrial adenocastma if this is persistent Will it result in cardiac cancer or not? If it's in persistent hypertension or in persistent valvular regurgitation, will you have cardiac cancer or not? You won't have cardiac cancer. What happens? It might result in heart failure. It will not cause cancer, but definitely it will result in a heart failure, right? There's no cancer formation. But the organ undergoes damage, more and more and more big chamber, less cardiac output, which results in cardiac failure or heart failure. That's the outcome here. There's no cancer formation here, right? That's for hypertrophy. So we'll go with the same template for metaplasia. The third cellular adaptation is metaplasia, right? We'll go with definition. So what is the definition for metaplasia? It's change of one epithelium or mesenchyme by another epithelium or mesenchyme. That's the definition of metaplasia, right? So metaplasia means meta is change, right? So there's a change in or change from one mature, mature or you can use the term adult. Adult and mature means one and the thing, same, right? One mature epithelium, don't restrict this epithelium or a mesenchyme. Because mesenchyme also can have metaplasia, right? To another adult epithelium or mature epithelium and mesenchyme. Okay. Another epithelium or an mesenchyme. Okay. It's a change. So whenever there's a thing, uh, a definition, I need two more things here. Stimulus and I need a mechanism. The mechanism of action of metaplasia is there is a reprogramming of stem cells. You reprogram stem cells, that is the cause of metaplasia. It's just going to change. Normally, I produce squamous, now I change and I produce columnar. Just reprogram stem cells as simple as that. Perfect, Dhanush. Okay. Now, what's the commonest example which comes to your mind? When we, we talk about metaplasia, obviously, few things will come to your mind. One is definitely Barrett's esophagus, right? Barrett's esophagus is an undoubted thing which everyone knows. And as an examiner also, I expect you to write Barrett's esophagus, right? So in terms of metaplasia, when you write the examples of metaplasia, especially with the short answer, you need not write everything regarding Barrett's, right? I want you to divide the paper. So just write like this. The original epithelium 
the stimulus and the metaplastic epithelium or metaplastic mesenchyme or metaplastic epithelium so divide them so it's kind of telling that in an barrage esophagus the normal squamous epithelium due to the stimulus of GERD changes to columnar epithelium so it's an entire journey which you are saying right so here right Barrett's esophagus in which an original squamous epithelium due to a stimulus of GERD becomes an columnar epithelium that's metaplasia use the same thing in case of respiratory mucosa you can write multiple things here using the same template normal respiratory epithelium is your pseudostratified columnar i'm not using the term pseudostratified here just write columnar a columnar epithelium due to tobacco smoke so just write smoking results in squamous epithelium okay that's a change here so i gave two examples can anyone give me one mesenchymal example Mason chemical example. Your myositis also begins, right? So Mason chemical example right here. Myositis ossificans. That's an example for Mason chemical metaplasia. So here the original epithelium is muscle due to etiology of myositis ossificans is most of the time an improper, okay, an improper mobilization an improper mobilization post fracture and improper mobilization results in a skeletal tissue right a skeletal or a bone formation in a muscle is an example for myositis ossificans okay so these are the few examples of metaplasia again we follow the same template you gave a definition you give a mechanism of action of reprogramming of stem cells and you write all the examples here, right? So that's the third thing of metaplasia, right? So last one is, I, maybe I'll include it here, your atrophy. That's the last ladder equation, atrophy. So atrophy is actually a gross term. Atrophy is not a microscopic finding. Atrophy is in, it's a gross reduction in size of an organ or structure okay. so gross reduction in size of organ or structure is called as an atrophy okay. just give me a second okay. so atrophy microscopy i might have seldom Atrophy is something which can be reversible as well as it can be irreversible, right? It's a gross finding, that's all. So atrophy again, the mechanism of atrophy or the cause of atrophy is if there's a reduced protein synthesis or an accelerated destruction, both of them can cause atrophy, right? Generally, the mechanism of atrophy, there are two important things in atrophy. It can either be due to autophagy, excess destruction of the cell organs by lysosomes or it can be due to apoptosis. That's the mechanism of atrophy. If apoptosis is involved, can I say that atrophy can be irreversible? Is apoptosis reversible or irreversible? Apoptosis is irreversible. It's a cell death, right? So since there's autophagy and apoptosis, atrophy can be both reversible or it can be irreversible. Can be both reversible as well as irreversible that's classical for atrophy okay so again i need few examples of atrophy what are the few examples of atrophy whatever comes to your mind anyone i have again physiological atrophy we have pathological atrophy as well the same example what we gave for apoptosis notochord and embryogenesis is a physiological atrophy thymus undergoing atrophy during development is a physiological atrophy for sure right so again here i do have physiological causes you can use the same example. The notochord regression is a physiological example for atrophy. At the same time, you can have pathological examples for atrophy as well. Okay. Or an elderly brain. 
and elderly dementia okay so people who are like 80 90 years old will definitely forget things that's actually an atrophy of the brain parenchyma during elderly thing, right so pathological atrophy there are multiple examples for pathological atrophy example pem protein energy malnutrition right that's definitely an example for loss of protein all the entire body becomes smaller you must have seen pictures of kwashiorkor and marasmus classical example for atrophy you can write denervation in your first year you must have read about ulnar claw hand median nerve radial nerve claw hands right so these muscles get destroyed denervation induced atrophy or an disuse you don't use a limb post fracture the limb becomes smaller right that's a pathological atrophy just because we wrote elderly dementia the brain atrophy i have alzheimer's disease okay. alzheimer's disease is a pathological brain atrophy which also causes dementia but in a very uh, it's an abnormal destruction not an elderly age related finding right so these are for examples for atrophy right so i have mechanism of atrophy the definition and few examples physiological and pathological right that covers all the four syllabic atrophy hyperplasia hypertrophy metaplasia as well as atrophy right done any questions regarding uh, your cell adaptation if not we'll go to the next one pigment accumulation okay if you have any questions do let me know raj i hope i am able to make some sense for you now okay so if you want to be a little bit more slower do let me know okay so let's let's go to the next topic of pigmentation so pigment accumulation is definitely an important five mark question pigment accumulation and calcification both of them are important five mark question with respect to the first chapter right so with respect to pigment accumulation you have to just picture it again so in pigments i have extracellular pigment accumulation sorry exogenous pigment accumulation and endogenous pigment accumulation so i have to differentiate first again everything starts with one definition don't directly jump into it pigments are nothing but few colored substances which are accumulating inside a cell which gives clues to diagnosis that's why i need to learn about any extracellular or pigment accumulation right they are colored substances which accumulate in tissues which can be clues for diagnosis the only reason why we read about pigment accumulation is to help in diagnosing that's all so if i can use something for diagnosis definitely i will remember it for a longer time as simple as that right so pigment accumulation is about that so like i said we have both endogenous pigment accumulation which is something which happens inside the body and i have exogenous pigment accumulation which is something which is going to happen from outside the body like cold workers pneumoconiosis anthracosis I inhale coal from the pollution. It deposits in my lung and the hilar lymph node. It's from outside. Tactu pigment. It's from outside. Obviously, we don't get tactu from inside, right? Or I can have very rarely. You might have definitely heard about uh, those uh, accumulation of the char uh, character-related pigment. Again, it's not very common. It's a rare pigment accumulation for sure. Some metals can have ingest ingested pigment which can accumulate, right? asbestos can give a color silica can give a color right again these are come something which is coming from outside right so these are few outside and endogenous and exogenous pigment accumulation my most important thing is endogenous so concentrate more on that because exogenous i know what's happening with the history i can easily narrow down what it is but endogenous pigment accumulation we need to know about it right so again there are few pointers for every pigment first describe the pigment the source of the pigment and how do you identify the pigment that's more than enough for me right so endogenous pigment accumulation first is melanin so melanin is a normal pigment right so melanin is derived from your melanocyte the non hemoglobin pigment right it's a brown black pigment melanin is not generally black it's more of brown pigment seen in melanocytes so where do we see them in conditions because melanocytes a normal finding i'm not going it's not going to help me in diagnosis can anyone tell me in which condition you can have melanin excess melanin accumulation which can help me in diagnosis any condition which comes to your mind either excess or reduced both are important for me hyper as well as hypopigmentation right so melanin accumulation hyperpigmentation 
can be useful in diagnosis of melanomas, tumors, I can have them, nevus, nevus is a benign tumor of melanocytes, nevi, it's a mole, I can have in that, right, Addison's disease, you can have excess melanin deposition, that's one of very classical example, in vitamin B12 deficiency, in vitamin B12 deficiency, especially in your uh, megaloblastic anemia, you can see them in knuckles. Especially around the knuckles and elbows, you'll have excess melanin accumulation in case of a megaloblastic anemia, as in hyperpigmentation, right? At the same time, hypopigmentation also important for me. Hypopigmentation you see in classical case of an albinism or vitiligo. In vitiligo and albinism, you see less pigment deposit, hypopigmentation, right? So you have both hyper and hypopigmentation. And melanin, in microscopy, like I said, it's a brown black, pig, brown black pigment. I have a stain for melanin. Just add on to that. The stain for melanin is your Mason Fontana. Okay, it's a very good stain, which is useful for melanin identification. Right? It's a Mason Fontana stain, which easily can pick up melanin on a microscopy. If I have a doubt with other brown black pigments, fine. That's the first brown black pigment. Again, how do I see them? Where it is seen and few conditions where it can help for diagnosis. Because by definition, I said it's a colored pigment accumulation, which helps in di which helps in look for diagnosing conditions. So that's what we're going to structure the question as well, right? Second pigment for me here is lipopression. Okay. So lipopression here, again, where do we see them is important and the color is important. Lipopression is also an brown pigment but a slight variation it's an yellow brown pigment right everything here is brown only but here is an yellow brown pigment or yellow brown granules and they are actually seen in the cell in a lysosome seen in lysosomes so lipoption is not something which is uh, always seen in a pathological condition old age Aging will definitely accumulate lipoption. You must have read about brown atrophy of heart. Old age heart will have brown color accumulation, right? Lipoption has few more names. It's also called as a wear and tear pigment. Okay, simple wear and tear pigment. As a classical thing, which is a name given for lipoption. And we can see them in aging. Actually, cells aging, not the patient's age. It's a pigment of cell aging. It can be seen secondary to inflammation. You can have lipoption accumulation in a long term inflammation. In addition to melanin, we can have this as well. Lipoption, how do I identify in a microscopy? There is a stain for lipoption, but I don't want you to remember the stain. What is more important for lipoption is the location of lipoption, the paranuclear location of lipoption, the very important thing for identifying lipoption, right? That's one thing which is very important. Paranuclear location of lipoption is important for you, right? It asks about your lipoption accumulation. So we know about lipoption, we know about melanin, right? Next, let's go to third intracell endogenous pigment accumulation, which is iron. Instead of iron, I am more concerned about hemocytrin, which is the physiological deposit of iron called as. Can anyone answer the physiological deposit of iron? Physiological deposit of iron is your ferritin, right? We are actually not much worried about ferritin. I am more worried about hemocytin because it gives me clue. Ferritin is a normal finding. So I don't mind seeing, okay, it's seen in deodorum. It's not important for me to identify ferritin, but hemocytin is very, very important for me, right? Hemocytin, again, the starting point is same. It's also brown, golden brown pigment. It's just a tiny variation. One was brown black, one was yellow brown, one was golden brown. In reality, everything is going to be brown in color only. If everything is brown in color, I will not be able to differentiate things. So obviously, I need stain. Hemocidrin stains for a very famous stain, which I'm sure most of you know, which is Pearl's Prussian Blue. Okay. Pearl's Prussian Blue is the stain which is used for hemocidrin. So where do you see hemocidrin? Conditions which helps me in identifying hemocidrin. It's seen in a long-standing bruise. Any bruise over the period of days will definitely turn color. There will be Bill Rubin, Billy Word and Hemocytin will be the end stage for any bruise. And in case of liver, 
you see them in a pathological condition of an hemocellulosis or an hemochromatosis. In hemochromatosis or an hemocytosis, one is congenital, one is acquired. So both of them is an excess iron deposit which is seen in the liver, hemocytosis and hemochromatosis, right? That is also brown in color. The last but not the least, which is copper. Copper can also accumulate. Copper can also be brown in color. Bilirubin and acid hematin also pigments which are endogenous. We'll look at them very soon. Copper is also brown in color. Copper, the stain for copper is here. Orsine is a very good stain for copper. There's rhodamine or rhodonine. That's also a very good stain for copper. In addition to that, you see copper accumulation which helps in diagnosis of Wilson's disease. Yeah, this again is an endogenous pigment accumulation, right? Like I said, there are few more endogenous pigment which are not much helpful for me in a microscopy point of view. Clinically, much helpful is bilirubin. I'm sure you know the color of bilirubin. It's a yellowish pigment which is seen in case of jaundice. There are different types of jaundice. I'm sure you know how to identify them. You can, you can see them in skin. You can see them in your uh, bulbar conjunctiva. You can see, uh, I'm sure you must have seen patients who are ictrus. But in microscopy, it's not much important for me, except in few conditions of congenital jaundice. I won't require uh, to see bilirubin accumulation in a microscopy, fine. Next is your acid hematin. Again, uh, acid hematin and bilirubin are just extra pointers, right? Acid hematin is actually in malarial pigment. Okay? It is seen in malarial infection. In, it's seen in case of inside the WBCs, sometime even in the RBCs. Because malaria is seen, it's an hemoparasite, right? It is seen inside the RBC and WBC. So I see acid hematin accumulation inside the RBC and WBC in case of a very florid malaria. Um, in very less severe malaria, I may not see them. Uh, like in falciparam malaria, very high parasite index. You definitely will see acid hematin in your RBC and WBC. All these are endogenous pigments, right? I just go up once again. So you have a definition for pigment, colored accumulation, which helps in the clue for diagnosis. Endogenous as my melanin, the color, where do you see them, and stain. And I have for lipoption, the color, and clues wherever we see them. And for iron, again the color, the stain, where do you use them for diagnosis. Stain for copper, and adenos, your bilirubin and acid hematin. Exogenous is actually not that important. In your PDF, you have lots of things for exogenous pigmentation. But exogenous, at least remember, tattoo and coal. Coal, I want you to remember, right anthracosis. Because anthracosis, which is something which is very important, or a coal workers pneumoconiosis. Because anthracosis and coal workers pneumoconiosis, you must have ridden your respiratory system, right? So, this is something which I want you to remember. There are multiple things like carrot can cause, lead poisoning can cause. There are multiple other things which can cause pigment from outside, exogenous, but not that much of important for diagnosis. So, we can ignore a little bit of them, right? Okay. So, these are for pigmentation. Okay. Now, Let's go with one question in your uh, post chapter embolism. Uh, sorry for exceeding the time. I hope it's fine. We'll just quickly go through the embolism and we'll see what it is. Uh, different types of embolism and what do you mean by embolus, right? So embolism again, you need a definition. Can anyone define an embolus in whatever words you know? I don't want a textbook definition. Anything which comes to mind. What do you mean by embolism? Because the first line or first two lines in a paper makes a very huge impact for a reading examiner. What do you mean by embolus? Where do you see an embolus? We'll, we'll try to uh, form a definition. You see them outside the vessel or inside the vessel? We'll go one by one. You see an embolus? Inside the vessel, right? Embolus need not always be a blood clot. We have air embolism, right? We have amniotic fluid embolism, as well as we have pulmonary thromboembolism. So embolus as such, First, it is not attached to the vessel wall, right? It's a detached clot or a liquid or a gaseous form. Like I said, there's an air embolism, there's an fat embolism, there's an amniotic fluid embolism. So it's not always clot. It should be detached. It should not be attached to a blood vessel. If it's attached to a blood vessel, we call it a thrombus, right? It's, we call it a thrombus, right? Uh, or a gaseous form, okay, which is 
carried by the blood by the blood circulation from its point of origin to a different side from its point of origin it's been carried away that's all most of the time when i talk about embolus i don't talk about air embolism or amniotic fluid embolism which is which is literally rare most of the time embolus is related to thromboembolism that's a main focus right so let's assume i have a blood clot blood clot here attached to a blood vessel it's been broken from here and is going outside and is carried different place that's what i call it as thromboembolism or from a fracture we call it an amniotic fluid embolism right okay or from a liquid that's amniotic fluid or from fracture we call it fat embolism right these are three different types of embolism fine okay great now let's go to two important points about every embolism pulmonary thromboembolism which means which is going to have i'll have i'm going to have em thrombus from a different place breaking off and going to my lung and settling in the lung that's why it's in pulmonary thromboembolism for most of the pulmonary thromboembolism what is the origin because like i said blood is something is going to carry the embolus from a site of origin to a different site so most of the time origin is dvt it's your deep vein thrombosis right so deep vein thrombosis is one of the important origins for pulmonary embolism most almost the commonest finding where uh, where is the origin of a thrombus from right so from a deep vein thrombosis it can go to different sites it can go to a pulmonary circulation maybe it pulmonary capillary i'm just calling it a pulmonary circulation which results in i'm writing pt for pulmonary thromboembolism sometime the same embolus i have two or three different names we just have to use the names the same embolus which is very big let's say that these are pulmonary artery my pulmonary artery is bifurcating like this right so it's a very big embolus which kind of sits and covers the entire pulmonary artery coming from the deep vein thrombus only thrombosis from there it's coming and blocking everything right if it blocks the bifurcation of pulmonary artery if it settles in the bifurcation of pulmonary artery what is this embolus called as we have a very good name for it we call it an saddle embolus right call embolism an saddle embolism The saddle embolus it just sits in the bifurcation of the pulmonary artery. It's a saddle embolus, right? Third possibility, not always, but a rare possibility, right? Let's assume if a venous embolus gets into an arterial circulation. It's very unlikely. If it's a deep vein thrombosis from the veins, it goes to the, your uh, venous return goes to the right side of the heart. It's very very rare for it to go to the left side of the heart, unless and until there's an intraatrial or an intraventricular defect right so if an asd atrial septal defect or an ventricular septal defect an embolus from the venous circulation can enter your arterial circulation so this i call it an paradoxical embolus okay? it's a paradoxical embolus normally a dvt will not a deep vein thrombus blood will not go into your arterial circulation if it goes into arterial circulation the only possibility is there's an atrial septal defect asd is for atrial septal defect and vhd is for ventricular septal defect it just goes there and becomes paradoxically embolus right so these are three different names given under pulmonary embolism now i did need to know a little bit about the clinical manifestation of it because the pulmonary embolism might be a serious condition might be a very subtle condition it might even kill the patient or something just it will cause tachycardia most like 60 to 80% of the pulmonary embolus they are clinically very silent they don't cause much of problem maximum the patient la tachycardia you identify them you treat them even otherwise it's fine they are very tiny they become organized and they'll be dissolves over the period of time 60 to 80 percent of the pulmonary embolism are very very silent, but if it's like a saddle embolism, I can lose the patient immediately as well, right? Or otherwise, I can also have, in case of very huge pulmonary embolus, I can have a sudden death also. A sudden death is also possible due to a core pulmonary, core pulmonary is a heart failure, secondary to a lung cause. Okay? 
This happens if the embolus is going to cover more than 60% of circulation, of the pulmonary circulation. If more than 60% of the lung circulation is blocked by bl the blood clots, I might lose the patient. That's a possibility. Well, definitely there's a possibility I might lose the patient, right? Or it can end up in pulmonary or lung hemorrhages. There's just bleeding happening because of a, a tiny artery is being blocked and the artery is being eroded and it uh, ruptures. It can result in a pulmonary uh, hemorrhage or it can result in a tiny pulmonary infarct as well. It's a tiny area, not clinically significant, not causing death of the patient, right? Th these are a few possibilities or outcomes of a pulmonary thromboembolism. We know the origin of pulmonary thromboembolism, where all it can settle and the clinical names given to it and the clinical symptomatology of pulmonary thromboembolism, right? That's first thing. The second thing for us is, air embolism. The air embolism, uh, these days they are very very rare. Uh, air embolism used to happen in a condition called a C your uh, Kaysen's disease, decompression sickness. If you had gone, gone to scuba diving, you come up rapidly, that air can, the nitrogen can come out there and cause problems in the muscle and aches. These days are very rare, right? Air embolism is, there are few places still where air embolism can happen apart from the decompression sickness. We look into it, right? So gas, within the circulation can become a frothy mass and can obstruct the vascular flow. That's how it causes injury, right? Any gas becomes a frothy mass in the liquid and can obstruct an organ and which will cause ischemia. Places where I can see air embolism. Air embolism is, like I said, it's rare. I need at least 100 ml of air to enter the circulation to call clinical effect. So don't uh, think that when you're going to do an, give an injection, if sudden, by chance, like 2-3 ml of air goes, it might not cause some more clinical damage. Minimum of 100 ml of air is required to produce clinical effect and I need at least like 300 to 500 ml of air to cause death, right? So the dose here for me is very critical. I need 100 ml of air into the blood circulation to be clinically significant, which is very rare these days. And I need at least 300 to 500 ml of air to cause death. Which can definitely kill the patient. To cause death, I need this much amount of air, right? There are few places still air embolism is possible, especially when they do a uh, surgery of the brain. Brain surgery are done in sitting portion. So there's a possibility air can be sucked inside. But there are sophisticated equipments there, which will definitely minimal, minimize that. When I do a uh, vascular stenting procedure, there's a possibility of air entry, right? So possible etiologies for air embolism. Again, these are very rare these days. One, surgery, especially neurosurgery in sitting procedure can cause this. When a person is sitting, patient is sitting and the surgeon is operating, you must have seen them in your Grace Anatomy and your uh, Good Doctor series. Person sitting and the surgeon is operating. So the pressure difference can suck in the air, right? Then stenting procedures, stents given or any endovascular procedures, not just stenting. I use a catheterization. Any endovascular procedure, there's a possibility of air entry again, right? Third is your decompression sickness. This I'm sure you must have read in your physiology itself, the Kaysen's disease or the bends, where there's a rapid ascent in a patient who has gone with scuba diving because of the pressure, the air can enter and it can cause, cause some painful conditions, right? Again, these are the possibilities where air can enter, but all of these are extremely rare these days. Uh, it's almost negligible. It's a very, very rare thing where you're going to see an air embolism, right? Next is your fat embolism. Fat embolism, more than fat, I'll call it a bone marrow fat embolism, right? Fat embolism, one of the major causes, road traffic accident, They have a road traffic accident and it's going to affect a very large bone like femur and the femur has a fracture. Most of the time this can come as a 5 mark question in the clinical scenario. There's a road traffic accident and the femur has an open fracture. This femur is one of the largest bones. So when it breaks and femur is in an adult, it's definitely going to have fatty marrow because they are not going to produce erythropoids, right? So once a femur undergoes fracture, especially in adult, this fat 
or the bone marrow and its fat enters circulation. The problem with fat or bone marrow entering circulation is it's not just going to cause obstruction, it'll cause some activation also. Because a fat molecule is entering blood circulation, will it trigger thrombus formation? Will it cause thrombus? It definitely will cause thrombus, right? So I'll consume all the platelets. So when the fat is going to circulation, wherever it goes, it triggers thrombus, causes endothelial damage, consumes platelets. So there'll be thrombocytopenia. Second, it can go and block the brain, it can go and block any different organ, end organ damage. Third, fat is actually an inflammatory thing. It releases inflammatory cytokines. So that also can be a problem. It's not just a fat going inside, it's going to cause lots of trouble here. So once fat enters circulation, one, it can accelerate thrombus formation. So once it undergoes thrombus formation, the patient will definitely have thrombocytopenia. Because there are criteria to identify fat embolism, one of the important criteria there is thrombocytopenia. There's a criteria called GERD's criteria. That's definitely there. One of the important things is thrombocytopenia from here. Right? Because of thrombocytopenia, you can end up in having petechial rashes. Petechia all over the body is one of the classical findings as well, right? So again, the fat can act, it's, it's an inflammatory product, right? It increases inflammation. Because of this inflammation, it can result in having a systemic inflammation which can result in ARDS or the fat can go and block the pulmonary artery and cause lung respiratory failure. Dual way it can cause respiratory failure, right? At the same time, the fat can obstruct vital structures. When it obstructs your brain, the patient might end up in having a coma. When it obstructs the lung, it can end up in having an uh, dyspnea, tachypnea, tachycardia, something related like an acute lung injury, right? So these are the findings by which a fat embolism will manifest. Most of the patient's fat embolism is diagnosed post-mortem. Right? Because in a post-mortem, there's a find, an image from Robbins. You can see here the vessel wall. Yeah, the vessel wall. You can draw this diagram, put a vessel and draw fat because fat is clear. You can see here there are fat globules inside the vessel wall. It should not be attached to any vessel wall. It's just an embolus which is growing, going into the vessel wall, right? As a classical finding for a fat embolism, right? Last but not the least, amniotic fluid embolism. The amniotic fluid embolism, again, it's not very, very uh, common. It's uncommon. Uh, in US, it is ranked fourth or fifth in terms of maternal mortality. It's a very rare finding, but yes, a significant finding which can kill the mother, right? So amniotic fluid embolism, it's a rare complication of pregnancy. So as the name says here, the amniotic fluid enters the maternal circulation. It's not going to cause a problem to the fetus. It's going to cause a problem to the mom, right? Into the maternal circulation. It again has multiple effects. It again triggers DIC because it's fluid entering a blood circulation. It will keep on activating the endothelium wherever it goes. It results in DAC, it results in ARDS, it results in shock, multiple organ failure will be there, right? So there's a possibility it can occlude the circulations, it can occlude a pulmonary vessel or occlude any vital organs. That's one. It will definitely cause endothelial damage. Once endothelial damage happens, in the fourth chapter, you must have read about shock. The same sequelae happens. It results in DAC, MODS is multi-organ dysfunction failure, shock, and I lose the patient. Okay. So how do I see them? In a microscopy, in post-mortem, you can see, uh, if you remember embryology, you must have read that uh, the surface or the skin is covered by something called vernix. Vernix case you saw your lanugo hair, right? You must have seen them. So in microscopy, you will see fetal skin, the vernix or the lanigo hair okay, inside the circ, inside your blood vessel. That's a very important clue. How does skin it look in a blood circulation in a microscope? It's like this. Skin is always like keratin pearl, right? It looks like keratin. Be it a fetal skin or adult skin, it has the world appearance. So this is the clue for an amniotic fluid embolism. 
So again, there's an image from Robbins. You can just draw a vessel wall and put curls inside them. That's an amniotic fluid involves, right? So that's about involvement. I think I've taken a little bit of extra time of yours. Fine. Uh, so we'll conclude the session. So the motto is very simple. Uh, please, for the next class of pathology, I want you to read what is in the Faray book. You can get the Faray book. You download the app. You'll have the uh, Faray thing on the homepage. Click that. It's free for everyone. Read them once and then sit for the class. So that you can use the best use of the class. It's a revision class, right? So I might be going a little bit faster. Just because you already know the subject, you have conf confined everything in a very short, like it's a 200 page book for the entire pathology. We've included most of the things which has been repeatedly asked. Look at the lectures, uh, look at the PDF first, listen to the lecture, open the PDF because I'll be more or less covering the same points. So it's an add on thing for you and not something new which you're going to read, right? So it will help you definitely prepare for your upcoming exams. And I hope the entire phase of uh, both farm path or micro will be of use for you. Fine. Any doubts do let me know. Otherwise we'll call it a day. Any doubts? Okay. If there are no doubts, we'll call it a day. Thank you for your time. See you guys. See you soon. Bye-bye.